Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's briefing. I want to start this afternoon by updating you on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,400 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 18 from yesterday. A total of 1,073 patients are in hospital with COVID-19, 732 who've been confirmed as having COVID and 341 who are suspected of having the virus. That represents a total reduction of 41 since yesterday, including a decrease of three in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 27 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. And that is a decrease of six since yesterday's numbers. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,688 patients who had tested positive for the virus have been able to leave hospital, and I wish all of them well. Regrettably, I also have to report that in the last 24 hours, nine deaths have been registered of patients who have been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,362. And as always, I want to stress that these numbers are more than statistics. They represent individuals whose loss is a source of grief to very many people. I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a virus, to a loved one to this virus. As Health Secretary, I also want to once again thank all those working in our health and care sectors. That thanks is due to all staff, to people working in NHS 24, in emergency dental and eye care, in GP practices and COVID assessment centres, in care homes and in hospitals, to our paramedics, our procurement staff, porters, cooks, cleaners, maintenance, everyone who contributes to keeping our health and care services running. Your work is essential to the health and well-being of all of us, and we are all very grateful to you. I have two issues I want to address briefly today before focusing on the next steps for the NHS. The first relates to the lockdown restrictions which took effect on Friday. I know that this weekend there have been many long-awaited meetings taking place in the sunshine. I know they will have brought joy to very many. But I can't emphasise enough how much we need you to stick to the rules that we've set out. The central advice continues to be stay at home. That is the best way of stopping the spread of the virus. I know that it is hard in the good weather, but it is essential. The reasons you can leave your home are exceptions. They are not the norm. So if you are meeting people outside, there should be no more than two households in any group, and ideally no more than eight people. Each household should so socially distance from the other, and also, of course, from any other groups that are in the same place as you. And you should not meet with more than one household once in a day. Remember also that every person you meet could pass the virus to you and you could pass the virus to them, even if you feel well. So remember the basic precautions you should take. Wash your hands, cough or sneeze into your elbow or into a disposable tissue and try to avoid touching your face. Don't touch shared surfaces such as park benches or play parks. And if you can, wear a face covering in shops and on public transport. Please don't travel more than five miles from your home and don't crowd beauty spots, rural locations or small villages. Car parks in many of these locations remain closed. They're closed for a reason, to stop crowding. So please don't ignore that. Don't park on verges or at the side of the road as an alternative. That is unsafe in itself. If it's crowded, please change your plans and go elsewhere. And please don't go indoors. Being in someone else's house must still be avoided. 
unless you are providing support, of course, to someone who is vulnerable. Fundamentally, life may feel a little less restricted, but it should not feel normal. I know these restrictions remain tough, but they are necessary. The changes we've made are intended to improve people's quality of life while continuing to minimise opportunities for the virus. If we don't respect these rules, then the virus will begin to spread again. I know that the majority of people are following the rules and the law, but we have heard and seen some reports this weekend of more than two households meeting, of house parties taking place, and of large gatherings outdoors. None of that should be happening. It puts you and others at risk. So I want you to enjoy meeting friends and loved ones, but please do it sensibly. Think about your actions and remember that for all of us, our individual decisions are crucial, not just for our own safety and that of our loved ones, but they're crucial for each other. The second issue I want to talk about is shielding. I know that for the last three months, more than any other group of people, the restrictions that we have asked those in the shielding group to follow have been incredibly difficult. I also know that it is tough for you to see restrictions being eased on those who are less at risk and that you want clarity about when you can start to lead a less restricted life. We will provide you with that information over the course of the next few weeks. We have not forgotten about you, but I want to stress that the changes the UK government announced yesterday are for England only. They do not apply in Scotland. We've asked you to shield because the virus represents a very serious risk to you. You matter. And so we need to be very careful to get our advice right for you as we work through how we can safely ease the restrictions you face and what you can do to keep safe. In doing so, we will try as far as we can to move away from a blanket approach which requires all of you to stay at home all of the time to, to one that reflects both the latest clinical evidence and your individual circumstances. The final issue I want to talk about today relates to any, the NHS in Scotland. The Scottish Government has today published a framework for NHS mobilisation. It sets out the core principles that underpin how we will safely and gradually resume some of our services in the community and the hospital setting, which have been paused at the outset of the COVID-19 crisis. The mobilisation plan makes clear that we will start with the resumption of those services whose absence is clearly having a detrimental impact on people's lives. But as we do that, we must make sure that we keep sufficient capacity to deal with any surge in COVID-19 cases. And we will build on some of the improvements that have been made as a result of responding to the virus, particularly in primary care, through, for example, increased use of digital consultations. Mental health support, something which is arguably more important now than ever, will be made more widely available. And the care offered at emergency dental hubs will expand as dentists prepare to open. In hospitals, we will start some elective surgery that is urgent and has been postponed. As we emerge further from lockdown, more services will resume, including, for example, cancer screening services and services for managing chronic diseases. And although it may seem a strange thing to say on one of the hottest days of the year, we're already looking ahead to the winter months, the normal flu season, as well as to the continued risk of COVID-19. So our planning must take that into account and use the next few months to restock and replenish supplies. The plan sets out an approach which is cautious, phased and based on evidence. It is informed by our experience in recent weeks. The remobilisation will happen in stages with constant checking on the prevalence of the virus and the R number. The plan charts the way we will help the health service 
resume important services alongside making sure the virus continues to be suppressed. And as those decisions are made in that slow, evidence-based way, we will make sure that patients are well aware of what to expect and that you, the wider public in Scotland, know what we are doing and the reasons for it. I'm just about to hand over to the Chief Nursing Officer and the National Clinical Director. Before I do that, I want to restate once again our key public health guidance. Lockdown in Scotland has been modified slightly, but life should not feel normal. You should still stay at home as much as possible because the virus hasn't gone away. Don't meet with more than one household at a time. Don't meet more than one a day and keep to a maximum of eight people in the group. Stay two metres apart when you meet. Wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. Avoid hard surfaces and clean any that you are touching. And if you have symptoms, don't wait to see if you might feel better tomorrow. Get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. We are only taking these steps out of lockdown this weekend because so many people have stuck to the rules so far. If all of us continue to do the right thing, we will be able to relax more restrictions in the future. But right now, these rules remain the best way of protecting ourselves, our loved ones and our communities. So please stick with them. I'll now hand over to our Chief Nursing Officer, Professor Fiona McQueen. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. So today the Cabinet Secretary has outlined arrangements that we will be putting in place to remobilise our NHS. Now, of course, we have been open for business over the past few months and during lockdown and have heard of both heartbreaking and heartwarming stories about the way our communities and our health and social care services have responded in quite remarkable ways to care for people um, above and beyond what we would normally have expected. Today, I would like to highlight and remind people that whilst we are beginning to talk about remobilisation of our NHS, that actually our NHS has always been open for business to care for patients with, with COVID-19, but also for other urgent and emergency care and treatment that's being required. And all delivered in a way that people have been sticking to the guidelines, including our, our health and social care staff. And I do know what a worrying time this has been for all of us and how much people are looking forward to uh, being outside, already enjoying some of the easing, albeit slow and gentle, of lockdown. But firstly, I'd like to talk about the reduction that we're seeing in emer emergency presentations, both to our general practitioners and also to our accident and emergency department. And a reminder to people, you are not bothering the NHS if you are concerned about your health and well-being, either your mental health or your physical health. Please do contact us in the normal way and you will be cared for and, and given the appropriate advice. And you'll have noticed, those of you who have um, interacted with the service, at times that has been remotely, whether it's by video conference or by telephone, all of which is your symptoms are being assessed and treatment and care being offered, either remotely or then being asked to go to a health or social care service. So right now, staff are beginning to prepare to open up some services that have been put on hold. And some of these services that have been put on hold haven't been life-threatening, but they, they have been debilitating. If people who have been waiting for joint replacements or cataract operations, uh, these can be quite life-changing. And these will come later on in, in the phasing of, in, of improving access to our NHS. But we will only get to that stage if people remember to socially distance, to hand wash and follow the rules. So there will be many people incredibly grateful for the care and attention that the NHS has given in recent weeks and months. But we also know there are people there who are keen to get on with their more routine treatment because we know that their life will be transformed by it. That will only happen if we're able to deliver services safely and make sure that the virus is controlled. And in order to offer our services safely within our, our health and social care systems, you may notice some changes. 
There will be socially distancing, whether it's whilst you're waiting in an outpatient department or within a ward and department, and may be asked to take more hygiene precautions, such as hand washing. You'll also notice our staff, which is now becoming quite familiar, wearing their PPE. And therefore, we ask that you, you support staff when you're in our health and social care systems to socially distance, to allow them to socially distance where at all possible and make sure hand washing is kept under review. So this is vital to keep the virus under control in our communities and we need to make sure that the rules are followed. In particular, if you are outside, you need to socially distance from people out with your household. And it has been worrying for me over this weekend to see people who are out appearing uh, to be in groups of more than eight, appearing to have groups of more than two households and not socially distancing. And if this happens, then the virus, the spread of the virus will increase, people will become ill and we will not be able to look at remobilising our NHS because we'll then have to uh, continue to care for increasing numbers of people with COVID-19. So please, uh, the lockdown um, is gently being eased. We are keen to make sure that we can begin to offer services more widely, but we can only do that if everyone remembers what the rules are and puts them in place. And if we all follow the rules, we will stay safe and healthy as we possibly can be. And by doing that, we will also be supporting our health and social care staff so that they can care for all of us. Thank you very much, Fiona. And now to Professor Jason Leach, our National Clinical Director. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I want to confess to some nervousness and anxiety this weekend. I, wa I want you to remember that there will be a number of families not in the parks this weekend and not having family barbecues in back gardens. There are 732 people in hospital with this disease with confirmed COVID-19. There are 27 families with a loved one in one of our intensive care units. And there are nine families in the last 24 hours who have had to be told by a care team that their loved one has died of this disease. The route map phases can go backwards as well as forwards. And that direction is dependent on the behaviour of each and every one of us. It depends on you following the rules. And those rules couldn't have been made any clearer by the Cabinet Secretary just a few moments ago. The second thing I want to talk about today is our transportation system, very briefly. For the last nine weeks of lockdown, we've all been travelling as little as possible. But during this time, Scotland's transport system has not been closed. It's been working to keep the country running for essential workers. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say a heartfelt thank you from all of us to everyone who's made this possible. The drivers, the conductors, the customer service personnel, the ticket sellers, the maintenance workers, the team managers. The list goes on and on. We're incredibly grateful to all of you who have been working to keep both passenger and freight services running. Over the next few weeks, people in some sectors who can't work from home will begin to return to their workplaces, perhaps some even tomorrow. And those of us who have to take public transport to get to work will start to use buses, trains and trams again for the first time in a long time. If you're one of these people who needs to start using public transport, please remember, do not travel if you feel unwell. Don't go out. Go on nhsinform.scot and self-isolate. Don't board a train, a tram or a bus if you think it is unsafe to do so. Wear a face covering on the public transport and keep two metres away from your fellow travellers who aren't in your household. Travel at off-peak times if you possibly can and spread your day out and your workplace should make allowance for that to happen. And finally, please be patient. Be patient with fellow travellers, but importantly also be patient with the staff who will find this time of transition equally difficult. Finally, if you see a public transport worker this week, perhaps thank them. Reach out, thank them for the long hours they've been working and for keeping us all moving. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to the journalists who have joined us this afternoon. And the first of those is Ryan Mayer from Scottish Television. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the owner of a private care group has said this morning that they've had three months of mixed messages 
mismanagement and missed opportunities. And they feel betrayed about the Scottish government's handling of the COVID-19 crisis, insisting that more should have been done sooner. Can I ask what your response to this would be? And if you could say what your assessment of the Scottish government's handling is as well. So I, I want to say a couple of things to that particular owner uh, himself. I, I'd be very happy to uh, meet with him and hear what he's got to say. Um, we could have had that conversation before now, but I'd certainly welcome it at this point. Uh, I don't believe that our messages have been mixed messages at all. We sent out very clear guidance on the 13th of March about what we were asking care home and care home providers to do uh, to keep their residents safe. We uh, worked on the premise, as we were right to do, that all care homes understood the importance of quality infection prevention and control uh, and of PPE, as they will, uh, should have done uh, and will have done in previous occasions before this virus. Uh, they have encountered flu, they have encountered winter vomiting and so on. Uh, but as it became clearer to us that, for example, their private uh, source PPE was failing, then the government stepped in to ensure that all care home providers, regardless of whether they were in the private sector or in local authorities or in the independent sector, had direct from our national stockpile the PPE that they needed, and we continue to do that. And when we uh, realised it was raised with us that care home workers, who have always been in the first priority of key workers to be tested, were fearful of undertaking a test in case it proved positive and they should uh, stay at home because their terms and conditions did not meet the government's fair work principles and they would see their income reduced significantly, we have stepped in to ensure that that fear is removed and the government will ensure that those uh, care workers in that circumstance, uh, despite poor terms and conditions, are not faced with that almost impossible choice between losing significant income, uh, but doing what they need to do for their own health and safety, that of their families and, of course, of their residents. All of the decisions we have taken at various points throughout this period have been informed by uh, both the uh, advice and evidence that we've received from our clinical and scientific advisors, taking then the decisions that are informed by those uh, and by the issues as they have been raised with us from Scottish Care, the group that represents the vast majority of uh, care home providers in Scotland. So we have taken those decisions, the best decisions that we believed we could take in the circumstances at each step uh, as we had that information, that evidence, and responded quickly to issues that Scottish Care have raised with us. Now, I have said before, and uh, I won't hesitate to repeat it, that in the fullness of time, as rightly, uh, the entire country looks at the history of how this pandemic has progressed, the decisions that we've taken and others have taken, and takes a view as to whether at every stage with what was known then, those decisions were the right decisions, that is exactly the right thing to happen in the fullness of time. Right now, my focus is on what more do I need to do to ensure that the policy that we have announced about testing in care homes, both of residents and of care workers, is being enacted throughout the country in a consistent, clear way by all of those involved. And what more, if anything, do I need to do to ensure that we continue to do everything we can, working with those providers to protect the residents in those care homes and respond to the concerns of their families? Next, we have Stephen Godden from BBC. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you that, in your view, do you think the changes to the shielding guidance in England and Wales have come too early and when can people in Scotland who are shielding expect similar changes and what does that depend on? So as we've said before Stephen it, it is for uh, those uh, charged with making decisions for people who live in England for them to make those decisions and and I don't 
uh, know what information or evidence they might have been looking at in order to reach the view that they have reached. And, and I can't comment then any more on that. But what I do know is that uh, at this point, the concern that we have is that that group of people, and we know very well, I, I know completely how hard this has been for them and continues to be. But I also know that they know that they are in a very risky position in terms of the condition uh, of their own health and the steps that they need to take to protect themselves. What we will do, as I said, is we are working now uh, with the advice that will come to uh, me as the health secretary from the chief medical officer's advisory group, from uh, our chief nursing officer, from national clinical director, uh, about the uh, level of risk that that group continues to face and the impact on that level of risk of any easing of the current restrictions that they are under. Uh, I, I want to be able to agree to some easing, but I absolutely have to make sure that our advice to that group of people, hard though it might be to hear and even harder to put into practice for them, is absolutely focused on keeping them as safe as we can. So we will, in the uh, coming uh, period, reach a view as to whether or not we can ease any element of their current restrictions in any respect. We will communicate that very clearly with everyone in that group, setting out what we believe to be the risks that they continue to face, the advice that we give them to stay safe, why we have reached the view that we have reached, and what advice we're also giving to those who are supporting them, uh, who are uh, in contact with them to give them support as a shielding group. And we will take our time to get that right, notwithstanding the fact that I know that they are very keen to know what, if anything, can my life change, even in a small way, to make it easier than it has been over the, the last period of weeks. So we will do that. We have not forgotten that group. First Minister made that clear when she published our route map and last week when restrictions were eased for the majority of people in the country. We have not forgotten that group, but you really do matter a lot to us and we need to get this right for you. Next, we have Kath, uh, Catherine, Catherine Bussey from PA. Hello, Health Secretary. Um, I wanted to ask about Test and Protect, which of course got up and running on Thursday of last week. And I was wondering if there were figures available as yet for how many contact tracers have been involved in efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19 and how many people they have been in contact with to say that they could be at risk, that they may have been in contact with an infected person. Thanks very much, uh, Katrine. I don't have the exact numbers there that you are asking for. And, and of course, I'd want to be sure that they were absolutely accurate before I gave them to you. Uh, Test and Protect began on Thursday, was uh, stood up, if you like, on Thursday uh, with uh, that uh, 2002, I think, were the number of contact tracers we had uh, ready to be deployed on Thursday. Uh, but the numbers of uh, tra contact tracers who've been used and the number of uh, contacts that they have worked on in the three days or so since then, I don't have those numbers. We have made a commitment to publish that information on a regular basis, but if we do have that uh, as of today, then we will make sure that you have that this afternoon. Uh, other than that, on the whole operation of Test and Protect, which of course is absolutely vital to us being able to ease any of the lockdown measures. Uh, I don't know if uh, Jason wants to say a bit more on that. Only that I, I have heard no problems uh, around the country. I, I know that contact tracing is up and running. I was involved personally in an individual case, which I won't describe because it's an individual case, about care moving between health boards quite, quite routinely, in fact, across Scotland's National Health Service, like we always do. And there was a contact tracing element of, of that case, and it was being handled 
perfectly well by contact tracers and health protection teams. So it gave me some reassurance that that system was working. And I haven't heard any intelligence to suggest to me that there are teething problems. I actually anticipate that it will not be perfect from day one. You would expect a system that we are ramping up at this scale to perhaps give us some intelligence that we might have to uh, go in and have a little look. But I've heard nothing in the last three days to suggest that anything is wrong with our test and protect system. It also gives us the opportunity, of course, to say that test and protect relies on individual behaviour, not just on the National Health Service doing its bit. It relies very heavily on the individuals who get tested and on those who are contacted by the tracers to follow their instructions. Two other things I, I would say just before we, we leave this is that when we stood up Test and Protect on Thursday, not only did we have those 2002 contact tracers identified, uh, every single board in Scotland had its teams ready uh, and uh, all our public health partnerships, who are the, the groups that will provide support for those who need it, who are asked to isolate, were also ready. So uh, our system, both at a national level and locally, uh, was ready at the point when we stood it up as we needed it to be to uh, back up the easing of the lockdown measures that the First Minister uh, announced. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we are in constant contact with those teams in order to identify where there are teething issues that might need to be addressed and that will continue uh, all the way through uh, as the system beds in and we make sure that everything is working as it needs to work. Next, we have uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, Health Secretary. Um, the First Minister stated this morning that the care home death rate in England and Wales, Wales may have been underreported. Um, but is it not also the case that Scotland's care home death rate uh, has been underplayed given the number of excess deaths recorded in care homes? over and above those which are registered as being COVID-related? So I, I don't believe that Scotland's um, numbers are being uh, underreported at all. National Registers of Scotland, which of course is an independent organisation that works to very high professional standards, uh, publishes every week uh, all uh, deaths in Scotland, including uh, those that are related uh, either confirmed COVID deaths or where COVID is a, a, a feature on the death certificate. And it also sets out the location of those deaths and uh, additional information in terms of excess deaths. So I am confident that the figures that are published weekly in Scotland are accurate and are not uh, in any sense uh, underreporting at all. Um, those figures are concerning, and they are concerning to all of us all of the time. Uh, we know, and, and we don't say this glibly every, at every briefing, that every single one of those deaths is a, a loved one lost and that people are grieving. And the whole issue around excess deaths, I may ask Jason to say a bit more on that in a moment, uh, is actively being looked at to try and understand uh, why uh, there are the level of excess deaths that there are uh, and what, is the, what are the contributory factors to that. This isn't some kind of competition between the nations uh, in the United Kingdom. It matters to everyone and we need to understand for now, but also for our future work, what are the contributory factors there and what more might we need to do in the immediate, but also the medium and the long term to uh, get, uh, get Scotland and Scotland's health into a better place. Jason, do you want to add to that? So excess deaths is a really difficult statistical concept and a difficult piece of data to gather. We, we use it for things like special things that happen. So if you imagine there was a heat wave and we looked at a three month period around Scotland and compared it with three month periods for the last 10 years, and we would calculate 74 people died in addition to what is normally expected during that period. And we wouldn't have particular diagnoses attached to them. And we would then suggest, statistically, those 72 people had died as a result of the heat wave. So it is not an exact science. The excess deaths 
for this disease are a, are a data challenge for those not allocated with a COVID-19 diagnosis. Remember, in Scotland, everybody who a medical practitioner puts on the death certificate anywhere that COVID-19 was the main or contributory cause, they are counted in our mortality statistics, the weekly mortality statistics. The excess deaths number are not yet robust enough to compare country to country. The numbers I see in the media today, I don't think you could compare those countries. And as the Cabinet Secretary says, I don't think it's yet time for that comparison to be made. In time, there are European public health bodies which will look at excess deaths across the whole of Europe. And globally, there will be other organisations that look at that. Scotland has some things in Scotland that make it unique. It has deep-seated health inequalities. It has real challenges, particularly in the west of Scotland, with socio-demographic drift and disease. So like every other disease, COVID affects the poor more than the rich. So in Scotland, that, that will come through in our statistics, I have absolutely no doubt. So I think in time, that excess deaths data will be very, very helpful for us. Thanks very much. Next, we have uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Mark. Hello there. Um, it's been suggested by some of your supporters, um, including in the national newspaper, that you would have locked down a bit earlier if you had the, the, the financial levers to do so, that you were basically prevented from locking down earlier because you didn't have the furlough scheme in place. Uh, can you confirm that that's the case? And given that Nicola Sturgeon is now warning that she would have no hesitation in locking Scotland down again if the transmission starts to, to rise again, do you have an assurance from the Chancellor that he will financially back that or, or do you now have some extra levers that you didn't have at the start of the outbreak? Thanks, thanks very much, Mark, for that question. I repeat what, what we have said about the decisions that we made at the time using the evidence and the advice that was there, the information that was there for us. Uh, our intent all, the, all along at every stage, and it remains so, is to make the best decisions we can based on the information that we have available to us at the time. In terms of uh, whether or not uh, we would uh, lock down again, uh, we or the pace with which we would ease restrictions uh, and what might influence uh, those decisions, it will be what influenced our decisions uh, at every step of the way. And that is what we understand about the incidence of cases how the virus is being suppressed, the R number, its impacts on particular uh, groups of people and the emerging science and evidence that comes forward as it has done since the outset of this new virus that tells us more uh, as scientists and clinicians understand more about it. Uh, I don't believe that we have had any assurance from the Chancellor that he is prepared to modify uh, his uh, support uh, for uh, what happens uh, between any of the four nations uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, but we would continue to press that uh, as part of the United Kingdom, knowing that there is been, there has been agreement that we may move a different, a different pace in terms of how we ease lockdown restrictions or indeed whether or not we reimpose them, then I would hope that that uh, support for that approach is backed by making sure that there are no obstacles to it in terms of people being able to follow strong public health advice and guidance from us. Uh, and we will continue, I'm sure, to have those uh, discussions with the UK, with the Chancellor, my colleague Ms Forbes uh, has those on a regular basis and we will continue uh, to have those discussions with the Treasury and with her uh, colleagues across the four nations of the United Kingdom. Dan Sanderson next from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you all mentioned some of the images we've seen this weekend uh, with people flocking to, to beauty spots and what have you. Um, to the Cabinet Secretary, to what extent do you think that sort of breakdown in discipline among some people could be linked to Dominic Cummings' actions and also to Professor Leach. Um, 
would you expect over perhaps the next days or weeks to see a, a sort of spike in infections as a result of people's behaviour this weekend? Thank you. So the first thing I need, I need to say is that from what we have seen so far, and we will have more information as, as today plays out and, and we get into the start of next week, but from what I've seen so far, the vast majority of people continue to follow the public health guidance and the rules, as they have done throughout this period. And it is only because people in Scotland do that that we've been able at all to ease the lockdown measures in any respect. Uh, but there, there has to be some concern, uh, as Professor McQueen uh, highlighted, where we see groups of people of more than eight who, amongst the eight, are not socially distanced. Uh, they may be socially distanced from another group, but in that group of eight, they are not socially distanced. There's no physical distancing there. That has to be a concern because the, the point of the physical distancing of two metres is to stop uh, the virus jumping from one person to another. And so that two metre distance is not a number that we dreamt up. It's not there just to make people's life difficult. It's there for a purpose. And the purpose is about stopping the transmission of the virus. Now, uh, what I've seen in uh, recent weeks is strong polling evidence. Uh, people in Scotland certainly have a view about the actions of the uh, Prime Minister's uh, special advisor, but that has not stopped people in Scotland uh, paying attention to the clear public health advice from the Scottish Government. That has uh, not stopped or diminished in any way their uh, view that they need to listen uh, and pay attention to what the Scottish Government and our public health advice is. Uh, and there is at this point no indication that notwithstanding their view of uh, Mr Cummings and his behaviour, which is not uh, favourable to him, notwithstanding that, that has not influenced their actions in understanding, as the population in Scotland clearly does in the overwhelming majority, the seriousness of the situation we face, the importance of the public health guidance, and the importance of all of our individual decisions having an impact on not just ourselves and our families, but on each other, and that the decisions that others make have an impact on us. So uh, I have confidence that notwithstanding, uh, like everyone else on this platform today, I'm you know, that wee bit nervous about this weekend, notwithstanding that, I have absolute confidence that the people of Scotland will continue uh, to do what needs to be done in order to help us move slowly, carefully out of this pandemic, control the virus and begin to return closer to normal life. But they know we're not there yet. Tom Magna from... Oh, sorry, my apologies. You asked Professor Leach a question too. Too, too easy to not get me to answer. So the... The, I really hope what you suggested doesn't happen. I think it's important for the public to realise one of the challenges with this virus is behaviour today doesn't get you the virus tomorrow. It doesn't give you symptoms tomorrow, which is one of the real problems. The, the three-week legal review is not coincidental. This virus works roughly, on average, in three-week chunks. It takes about a week to show symptoms, about a week to get seriously ill, and about a week, I'm sorry to say, to die. So that three-week review is there for clinical reasons, not political reasons. We will therefore know what the behaviour this weekend does in about two weeks' time. So that's why we can't say, you've done really well, let's do more release on Tuesday. We have to wait. And that's really frustrating for us, for the politicians, and for the public. I completely understand that. So we will be able to advise the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister what this weekend's behaviour has done about two weeks from now. It's not an exact science because some people get sick later, some people get sick earlier, but in rough terms, that's how it works. My, my only other plea in answer to your question is to those who think the virus won't make them sick. 
and therefore their behaviour can be different. That might be young people, it might be young families who know that in the main children are not getting very sick. My advice to them is you're not just protecting yourself, you're also protecting those who are really vulnerable from this disease. It may be relatives of yours, or it may be the next person to sit on the park bench. You have no way of knowing where that virus is going. So that's why your behaviour is so, so important. Thank you very much, Jason. My apologies uh, to you and to Dan for almost missing you out. Uh, <laughs> how could I even have attempted such a thing? Uh, next, we do have Tom Magner from Carers World Radio. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Regarding opening up lockdown, my question is specifically about carers in the family home who have a job. If your boss is bullying you back to an unsafe workplace, but you can't get home care support that's safe against coronavirus, and you're forced to make a stark choice, I know it shouldn't happen, but it does. Which do you say is more important and why? Going back to work to earn money and risk care standards in your home, or rely on state benefits to stay at home and care for the person you love? So thanks very much, Thomas. It is an important question. I would say one thing before I ask uh, both Jason and Fiona to give us some advice on that. And the thing I would say about that is if, if in Scotland we have anyone in that position where they feel that they are being pressurised by their employer to return to work, notwithstanding the difficult circumstances that, Tom, you've outlined, then we want to know about that because my colleague, Ms Hislop, who's our economy secretary, is regularly in touch with employers, is working with employers to help them understand uh, what they need to do to help us, as we hear from them what we need to do to help them, uh, and uh, can work through some of those particular difficult issues as best we can. So we do want to know about that, because that is a very unfair place for someone to feel that they have been put into the position of trying to make that very, very difficult choice. But let me uh, go first to Jason and then uh, I'll pick up with Fiona to see if there's more that they want to add at this point. Well, only very briefly. I, I've spent longer with the unions during this pandemic than I ever have in my previous career. I've made it very clear to them and employers that none of the clinical advice is financial advice. Anybody who finds it uh, they are unable to follow the clinical advice for financial reasons, I think is wrong. And they should, if they can't get that sorted at employer level, they should raise it with their union, if they have one, and raise it with the government or the local authority. And we should be able to fix it. Building on what Jason said about the employer, what employers have to remember, now that we have our test and protect system in place, good employment practices will mean that their members of staff will not have to uh, self-isolate for 14 days. So it's going to be important that employers honour and respect and embrace the advice that we're giving to keep the population safe. If somebody is a carer for somebody, then pre-COVID, the arrangements then should, should stand. So if somebody had care at home or self-directed supports, then that should continue. And again, that's something that the Cabinet Secretary has intervened on in terms of making sure that there is sufficient uh, care at home for people who, who need that support that would then enable their uh, carer to go back to work, but only to go back to work safely, because clearly it's uh, important that the, the carer feels that they'll have the right protective equipment at, uh, when they're at work, they can travel to work safely if that's by public transport, so that they are not bringing the virus home to their loved one who perhaps is vulnerable if they're requiring to be cared for at home. Thanks very much. And now Andrew Learman uh, from The National. Uh, thanks, Health Secretary. Um, just on shielding again, you said you need a, a few weeks until you can update those who are shielding and that you won't eat anything until you are sure that it's safe. Uh, just to be clear, does that mean the evidence you're seeing at the moment means that it's not safe? Uh, uh, and further to that, you talked about a tailored approach. So Professor Peter Openshaw from NerveTag was on Mar this morning, as you might know. And he, he said new research revealed that many people who are shielding, particularly people who recover from cancer and people who suffer, some people who suffer from asthma, might not be as vulnerable as previously thought. Um, are you looking at this research? Is there a possibility that you would take these people off the shielding list? Thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, actually, your, your second question, and I will 
uh, ask Jason to uh, come in on some of uh, the points about that. But your second question actually plays an answer to your first one. So we, we want, as I said uh, at the outset of today's briefing, uh, we want to see if it is possible to have an approach that isn't a blanket approach for everyone who is currently in the shielding group to have to do exactly the same thing. That, that's by no means straightforward, and it, and it won't be. There's, a, I think, just over 120,000 people in Scotland in that group. So it cannot be personalised to every single one of those, but it involves careful clinical consideration about the clinical groups that are within that 120,000 people and whether or not there can be, in a safe way, any variation in the advice that we give. And that's why we're taking our time to be sure to allow those uh, clinical uh, areas of expertise, those clinicians and others, to take time to be sure and confident about the advice that they give me about what we should then be saying to all of the people who are in that shielding group. Uh, I don't know whether it will be different for different clinical groups. I'm not a clinician and I shouldn't be making that decision without the benefit of that advice. So that is why that and uh, understanding what the impact would be for that group of people of any easing in terms of uh, their exposure to the virus, but also the advice we should give them about what they could do to make sure they are safe. All of those factors have to be taken into account, in our opinion, before uh, decisions can be taken, notwithstanding the fact that I absolutely understand how difficult it has been and how keen people are to know whether or not they can safely move away even a little bit from the restrictions that they're currently facing. We understand that and we are taking the time to make sure, as far as we can, that we're getting this right. Jason. The shielded group, I think, are a, a perfect illustration of the balance that is so difficult to strike between protecting individuals from COVID disease and protecting them from their own disease and the consequences of lockdown. I, I worry about the Shielder Group. I have friends and family in the Shielder Group, and I, I don't like the fact that we've had to be so draconian with the advice to that group. In terms of timing, the Scottish Shielding advice finishes on the 16th of June, and we have, up to this point, I hope you agree, given people time to adjust to change. So we don't tend to announce something on one day and expect it to happen that day. So we will talk to those groups, the patient groups amongst them, and we will give warning and time to get used to what that advice might look like so people can ask us questions, so we can clarify if it's becoming a little bit more complex. And the Cabinet Secretary is right. There will be, I think, two elements of that. The Shielded Group has been a, a working group anyway. People have moved in and out of it. The core has stayed the same, those with solid organ transplants with most chemotherapy. But others have moved in and out as we've learned more about their disease and this disease. So we will adjust that, but we will hopefully also be able to potentially adjust the advice for that whole group. But that will, of course, be a balance of risk, and that's why we're worried about it. Thanks very much. Michael Blackley now from the Daily Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Um, this morning, the First Minister talked in detail about some of the decision making uh, around the decision to discharge 921 patients from hospital into care homes in March. Um, she said that at the time, the view was that people who didn't have symptoms, either because they were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, didn't shed the virus. Um, in actual fact, uh, there, there was a strong pool of evidence that there was some doubt about that at the time. Indeed, some of the government's own advisors raised concerns about the risk of this as early as in January and February. Um, did you take on board any views on that or did you, did you dis dismiss these concerns? So two things I want to say and then I, I, I will turn to Jason. Let me say two things really clearly. We didn't dismiss any concerns at any point. 
where those concerns that were raised with us on any, in any respect, whether it was around uh, discharge from hospital, whether it was around any other matter to do with handling of this pandemic, where those concerns were evidenced. They, were, they have never been dismissed. That is not how we work uh, as a government. Uh, and the second thing I, I would say is that uh, these are clinical decisions between clinical teams in terms of uh, any level of discharge where the individual uh, who is being discharged will need follow-on support. But the detail of that uh, and the question around uh, what was known about those who uh, were asymptomatic in terms of this virus, uh, I'll ask Jason to pick up some of that detail. So the, the knowledge about this virus has developed. So in January, the, the, the virus was less than a month old almost. So we have, we have learned each week, sometimes daily, I get, I get an inbox full of the scientific research that comes out every day. It's enormously difficult to investigate a new virus that is this young, five months old. We now know that asymptomatic carriage it is a challenge and people do shed some virus, but nothing like as much as when they have symptoms. So the pre-symptomatic phase is not as dangerous as the symptomatic phase. That, that makes sense because people are coughing and spluttering and spreading the virus onto surfaces. Let's remember, though, that even when we were ultra-cautious in that period because we didn't understand the virus, there were very clear instructions to receiving institutions from the sending institution to not have communal activities, to isolate patients, to look after them, and so that the spread would be contained. Because this is an enormously infectious virus, and we were concerned about that. We, we judged those who were sending and those who were receiving to make those choices about where the safest place was for patients to go. And often that was to go home, in fact, and be looked after by family in their home environment. And sometimes it was to return home to a care home. And sometimes it was to go newly to a care home, perfectly appropriately, between the clinical team at one end and the clinical team at the other. Thank you very much. Paul Hutchin now from Daily Record. Hi there. Um, Professor Devi Sridhar is one of the government's advisors on coronavirus. And she wrote a piece recently in which she criticised the shielding policy and called for it to be scrapped. I'll just read you one of the lines from the piece. Um, she wrote, there are serious ethical and moral questions around building a society where the healthy and young are left to circulate and the elderly, the disabled and the vulnerable are hidden away. Is that an analysis that you share? So uh, I, I know Professor Schreider uh, relatively well in that we have seen each other virtually uh, on more than one occasion in terms of that uh, CMO's advisory group that, that she uh, contributes very volubly to. And uh, has we have, in fact, had uh, some discussion about the shielding group. Uh, I, I personally do not believe that it is uh, the case that they ha have been hidden away. I think the, uh, the rationale and the evidence and so on that we based uh, those early decisions on were very clear and the support that was provided and uh, so on, uh, equally clear. And we've had groups since uh, who have uh, argued and uh, asked that they be part of that shielding group because they perceived themselves to be at risk when uh, they hadn't been included in the first group. And as Professor Leach has said, people have moved in and out of that group. But the, the discussions that we have had with Professor Schreider and others are precisely the ones that both uh, uh, Jason and I were referencing in terms of the current work that is underway to advise me as to whether or not there is any change that we can make in the existing restrictions for that group. And if there is, uh, what might that be? So uh, I'm very grateful to Professor Schreider for her involvement and for the contribution that she, as well as others, makes to that. Uh, discussion. We've not concluded it yet, as I've set out fairly clearly, uh, but we will do. And at that point, uh, we will make sure that the advice that we are giving 
to those in the shielding group is as clearly set out as we possibly can make it. And that we will do that in time uh, before any changes are made so that, as Jason said, people can uh, get their heads around what we're saying, ask us questions uh, and uh, make sure that everybody knows what it is that we're asking them to do and why and what the support will be that's there for them uh, to help them do just that. Callum Ross now from the PNJ. Uh, thank you. Um, the framework document that's just been published uh, discusses principles, including the need to have services close to people's homes and to try and minimise unnecessary travel. I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about how that was going to work in practice in, in, in Northern Scotland uh, uh, and particularly how it squares. I, I know you'll be aware of long-standing concerns in places like Murray about, about people having to travel to Aberdeen and in places like Caithness with people having to, to travel large distances to, to Inverness. Uh, th thanks very much for, for that question, Callum. It's, it's a really important one and actually, um, if we stop and think about it, a, a large part, if not the majority of our country, uh, is to varying degrees remote and rural. Um, and part of what we intend to do is build on some of the uh, good practice that has been developed in primary and community care in Scotland in response to the pandemic in order to continue to deliver services to people and see if we can't expand on that whilst recognising that for some uh, instances uh, you actually need to see the person, uh, the clinician needs to see the individual but also there are times when for the patient, that uh, personal relationship that is not um, transmitted through a screen is equally important. So again, it is a balance. But to give some examples of what that might look like, I'm going to ask uh, both Fiona and Jason to give us uh, a couple of examples from their experience uh, of what might, be, what might be possible, bearing in mind that what we've published today is a framework document uh, and we need to work through that very careful balance about what we can restart whilst we remain able to respond to any increase in the number of cases that come from the virus. So Fiona, do you want to start? And I think a lot of the innovative practice that we've seen and also the population's acceptance of the use of technology, the use of digital, a lot of that has been based on work that, that has happened over the years within the NHS. So for instance, the Western Isles has had advice from your clinicians you know, across the country, which means that their, their patients don't necessarily have to come off the island, even within their acute care. So we were ready, and in particular areas, NHS near me, so a lot of our community midwifery visits have happened remotely. Uh, and, and that has been very satisfactory. Similarly, our, our allied health professions can do a lot remotely and also other consultations. And as Cabinet Secretary said, there are going to be, if someone is acutely unwell from a mental health perspective, it may be better for them to see that clinician in person for the first consultation. But thereafter, a telephone conversation, a, 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 a FaceTime conversation may well be perfectly good in fact helpful because it stops the travel it then means people can be supported appropriately where they are and that's what we've been finding that people have actually thoroughly enjoyed the, the remoteness and, and similarly with our GP practices providing much more telephone based con consultations and only home visiting where it's been absolutely required. The District Nursing Service has, has also gone in to do that. So many really helpful examples that we would all be wanting to keep because it, it's better for everybody in, in the service, both the, the system, but also for, for patients stops and travelling. It means that their relatives perhaps can be with them when they've got the consultation and they can support them and help them. And we would hope to be able to build on that and in the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much, Fiona. Jason? Well, only a quick, a quick individual story. Pa pandemics are not good for your country, but there is good that can come from it. And I think NHS Near Me is a neat little illustration. When we launched it before the pandemic, I had the privilege of being involved on the day of the launch, and I spoke to a gastroenterologist in Aberdeen who told me that endoscopy is often three visits, a pre-op visit to discuss the symptoms, an endoscopy visit, which you can't do virtually, clearly, and a post-op visit to describe 
and talk about the results. And he described a individual who was a postman in the far northeast of Scotland. I'll not tell you which town, because that perhaps make him identifiable. And he had had an endoscopy in Aberdeen, but they had done the pre-op and the post-op virtually. He was on his post office round, a, an enormously important community asset, when getting his NHS near me appointment to get his endoscopy results. And they were negative, and he was fine, and he went on about his business. That kind of engagement with patients and families locally, but connected to specialists who may be distant, seems to me to be hugely important as we come out of this pandemic. Thanks very much. And now, uh, Paris uh, Gutsoyanis from The Scotsman. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I first confirm um, with Professor Leach uh, the comments that he made about new advice to the shielded category? So should we expect that uh, that advice might vary for individual, individuals with different conditions before the 16th of June? And can I also ask uh, you, Cabinet Secretary, um, the First Minister said uh, this morning um, in relation to the decision to move people from hospital to care homes that quote, people who didn't have symptoms, either because they were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, didn't shed the virus. Uh, but the World Health Organization was advising uh, as, as early as the 2nd of April that pre-symptomatic uh, persons can be contagious, uh, yet the guidance didn't change to care homes until the 22nd of April. Um, can, can, you, can you square that at all? Thanks very much. Jason, do you want to start? The shielded group has never been static. So the shielded group has always moved. So splenectomy, for instance, those without spleens, not in, then in. So we have always said that depending on the clinical evidence of who this coronavirus particularly affects and the high-risk groups, we will, of course, move people in and out of that. The shielding, shielding is not the law. Shielding is advice to protect individuals and families. So I would anticipate in the week and days ahead that we will make some adjustments both to the shielded group and to the advice to everybody inside that group, just as we've intimated. I, I can't tell you what that will be, but if the numbers stay down, I sincerely hope it will be to enable them to do more than they have presently doing. Because as we've said, I, 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 worry, I worry deeply about that group being uh, in their homes for all this time. And, and in answer to your second question, as we've uh, said many times, uh, I, and indeed the First Minister, benefit from advice from a, a range of individuals in terms of uh, those who are uh, scientifically expert in this, what the World Health Organization said from our very senior clinicians and through that advisory group that the Chief Medical Officer uh, convenes, as well as what comes to us uh, through SAGE and by other ways. Uh, and so at the time when we made the decisions, we made the decisions we made based on the information and the advice that we had at that point, bearing in mind that we have never said anything other than, as politicians, we are the ones who are accountable for the decisions that we make. But I also need to remind everybody that on the 13th of March, we issued very clear guidance to care home providers that was designed to protect their residents. And that guidance was about uh, residents spending a significant amount of time in their own room, the ending of communal activities, including communal dining. Uh, we stepped in uh, to ensure that PPE that had uh, fallen over from those private supply chains was picked up and supplied by us through our NHS stock. We, on uh, the 13th of March, said you need to end visiting uh, except for those exempted circumstances where someone is at the end of life or the resident has uh, particular uh, distress from perhaps dementia uh, about the other restrictions that we want you to put in place. And you need to uh, prioritise your infection prevention and control. All of those measures are central to ensuring that you pre prevent the transmission of the virus. Now, since then, of course, we have uh, increased the level of testing, including for patients who are discharged uh, from hospital into care homes, uh, both those who have been in hospital for COVID and those who have not, as well as uh, testing for care home workers and residents 
in care homes where there is an active case, care home workers uh, across all the care homes. Remembering too that care home workers and social care workers have also always been the number one priority along with NHS workers for key worker testing. So as I've said, those were all the steps that are really clearly laid out that we have taken and in the fullness of time. Uh, that look back at all the decisions we made uh, as a government in Scotland, as governments made in the rest of the UK and wider, will all be looked at with all the data and the information that people have to hand at that time against what was to hand at the time. And we will not only understand how all of the journey of the pandemic was undertaken, but we will, I am certain, learn lessons uh, for the future. And finally, Tom Gordon from The Herald. Hello, uh, Health Secretary. Um, you mentioned the testing of care workers and other key workers there, but if we look at today's statistics, it is the fewest number of people tested in a day since the 28th of April, barely a fifth of your capacity. Now, can you explain that? Are you, in fact, squandering a huge amount of your testing capacity? Or did you overestimate the demand? In which case, it's a bit of a hollow boast to say you have all this capacity when most of it's redundant. So, Tom, I don't, I don't think it's a hollow boast at all to say we've got the capacity. We've got the capacity. And uh, we, we, are, we are wise to have that capacity based on the planning assumptions that we've made for test and protect. There are two uh, routes by which the capacity is used, uh, and uh, that is the demand-led route where care workers come forward and they uh, go onto the uh, portal and they book a test. And the other uh, route is that route that, that we uh, initiate, which is those who are over 70 in our hospital setting, those in ICU, you'll see the number is coming down, those in respiratory wards, there is surveillance testing, and now we have test and protect, where we are asking people who have symptoms of the virus to contact NHS Inform, either on the website or NHS 24 through that uh, phone line, in order to book a test and at the same time isolate. That is central part of test and protect. Uh, as the care home testing continues, then uh, the capacity moves up and down depending on where the care home testing is at any one point. But uh, I don't think it is fair to say that uh, we shouldn't say we have testing capacity for 15,500 if that is not being used. Uh, we have testing capacity for 15,500 and that is part of us being ready as measures are eased from lockdown, to be able to continue to quell the transmission of the virus through test and protect. And that is a really important element. Without test and protect, you cannot control the virus as you ease lockdown measures. And therefore, we would be more restricted now, but as we go forward, in any uh, easing that we might uh, decide to take in order to help uh, life return a bit closer to normal. Now, constantly we are looking at that testing capacity. What more can we do with it? And how can we make sure that it is used more effectively in order to help us break the transmission of the virus, but also understand the, the performance of the virus, if you like, across society in Scotland? Thank you very much, everybody. That uh, concludes our briefing for today. Uh, can I thank uh, Jason and Fiona for joining me? Can I also thank Yvonne, our sign language interpreter, uh, and for all the work that our sign language interpreters do to help make these briefings uh, as accessible as we possibly can. Can I uh, finish by uh, just uh, repeating for all of us the points that were made uh, earlier in the briefing, and that is life should not feel normal today. It is possible uh, to meet that other household in a group no larger than eight, all of you socially distanced, uh, and it is possible, therefore, to meet 
for the first time, perhaps for a long time, family and friends and enjoy that. But life is not back to normal. So please continue to follow those important public health messages. Stay two metres apart. Do not go into each other's houses. Continue to wash your hands. Wipe down surfaces that others may have touched. And make sure that we continue to practise good hygiene measures, coughing into our elbow or that disposable tissue. All of that will help us get through the next phase of our uh, dealing with this pandemic. All of it will help us uh, continue to control this virus. If you've got symptoms, don't wait for tomorrow in case you might feel better. Get in touch with NHS Inform or NHS 24. Get that test booked, isolate, uh, and you'll get the test result as quickly as possible. All of that will help all of us make sure that we can live as safely as possible. We break the transmission of this virus and we can consider when the time is right if there is any more that we can do to ease the current lockdown measures. Meantime, for all of you, the overwhelming majority who are paying such close attention to these public health messages, my heartfelt thanks for everything that you're doing. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks very much.